And I certainly believe in taking steps to try and control our carbon emissions, precisely uh, not because I believe there's total certainty about what's ha going to happen, but precisely because I believe there's so much uncertainty about it. And it's hard, it's hard to think that we should be you know, uh, eagerly doubling or tripling our carbon emissions without, uh, without doing something about it. Uh, that's, of course, one of the reasons why I think cities can do things that are very good, right? That, in fact, some of the research that I discuss in the book shows the significantly lower levels of carbon emissions associated with living in dense urban areas rather than in in uh, decentralized sprawling areas. Um, you know, factoid that I like is that the average, uh, the average, the average single-family detached house uses 83 percent more electricity than the average urban apartment. Now, that doesn't control for income and family size, but even when you do that, as Matt Kahn and I do, we find a big, big difference between central cities and suburbs in, in carbon, uh, carbon emissions, and a big difference across metropolitan areas, where those metropolitan areas that are more centralized end up having significantly lower carbon emissions than those metropolitan areas that are decentralized. One way to think about this is if the great growing countries of China and India see their per capita carbon emissions rise to the level seen in, in the U.S., seen in the sprawling U.S., global carbon emissions will go up by 127 percent. If they go up by the level seen in also wealthy but hyper-dense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30 percent. Right? That's a, that's a huge difference and one that the, the planet will certainly um, will seem like we're facing less, less risk if, if they look more like Hong Kong and less like the uh, ex extreme examples of sprawl seen in, in much of America. Now, there are two major ways in which uh, cities are going to continue to, to enable the transfer of ideas that so far is not duplicable electronically. One of which is just in the random connections that the random learning that will occur from a, a young person who comes to a big city and sees things that they couldn't possibly have imagined seeing. Sure, you could set up planned meetings on Skype or whatever technology you want to use, but it's those unplanned connections that are often most valuable. The time that you see someone really screwing up or you catch an, catch an insight that turns out to be pure magic. And cities help that happen. It's a, it's, you know, a great irony that, that the that the city, that the industry, that has the best access to all the new technologies that enable long distance connection, right, is also the industry that has become the most famous example of geographic concentration in the world today. And of course, I'm talking about Silicon Valley. It is also, of course, an irony that Facebook, this wonderful tool for long distance connection, was formed in the dense corridors of, of Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, where indeed there appears to have been plenty of exchange of ideas that was very helpful in actually creating that that uh, that insight. And uh, one, one final thought I think that's really important on this. Anyone who's ever taught knows the difficult part of teaching is not knowing your script. It's not having the, the, you know, the thing that you want to communicate written down and clear in your mind. It's seeing whether or not it's getting through. It's understanding whether or not the idea that you have is actually making it through the skulls of your audience, making it into their heads. And face-to-face -face contact is so valuable for that. And that's, that's why we continue to teach in real classrooms. Sure, virtual classrooms can help. But really being there is enormously valuable because we have developed over millions of years these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion.